Extended stay hotels are one of the hottest segments in hospitality, and My Place Hotels stands out as a leader in the space. Today we're talking to President and CEO Ryan Rivett about what led him to start the company and what he's learned over the past 10 years about building the brand into the powerhouse it is today. We go back into his early childhood, his early career experiences to understand how he thinks about providing hospitality, how he thinks about running a hospitality business, and we get into the details, why he focuses on new construction and much more. So whether you're looking for inspiration on how to start a brand new hospitality concept, if you're looking for the keys to scaling rapid growth, or you're just interested in extended stay hotels, stick around. You're going to learn a lot. You know, it's it's been my entire life. The, the reference of hospitality and being in the hotel business and hotel development has been a conversation around the table and a focal point of family gatherings and things like that for my entire life. So um, as I grew up, that's that's kind of where I started. And I didn't go to work in the hotels when I was a teenager and things like that. I worked in restaurants in, in high school and, and in college and really enjoyed that part of it. I worked in the kitchen and, and uh, still love cooking today. But my my career journey in hospitality really came um, in my teens and 20s working in a in a fishing lodge that we have still today um, during the summer. And, and that's where I learned how, you know, to greet guests when they show up and 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 pay attention to detail of where their bags go and remember their names as much as possible from year to year as these people are repeat customers. And so you know, sort of that that spirit, spirit and the fundamental elements of hospitality the, the, at the innkeeper level. That that's really where I grasp those things. And so, coming into coming into uh, career hospitality for me, the entry point was was construction and development. So I was a long ways away from the guests in terms of what my role and function was in the company's starting off. Uh, but I think going back to those experiences as a teenager and in my college years of working in hospitality and, and working with uh, really a unique set of clientele in, a, in an upscale resort like that um, really helped me to understand the end goal of a hospitality project, even though I was on the front end in the development and construction side of it. So that was that was the basis. I love it. I wonder if I could ask about that experience at the lodge because I'm always fascinated by how people thinking about that those first few moments when you arrive on property. You think about a lodge, it's almost like the mo one of the most extreme forms of of travel and hospitality because you're probably traveling a really long way and you might even be more tired than most when you arrive. Do you remember uh you know back then was there anything that you found helpful and or, or useful in terms of of greeting someone well and kind of starting their trip off well? You know, <laughs> I think we had we had a kind of a, an advantage in that we're we're in southeast Alaska, one of the most beautiful places on earth. So that in and of itself makes up for any any uh, you know struggle you have with with the endurance of a travel day. Um, and then and then when people got there, you know the lodge is on on an island. It's in a in a really unique setting, so you're out and away from everything. Um, and so I, I remember people being exceptionally excited when they showed up. I remember being very particular about a lot of things. And so for me, it became, again, the, the attention to detail became the most important thing. I learned pretty quickly that if, if I greeted somebody at check-in and they told me their name and introduced themselves, and then, and then the next morning when they walked into the lodge to get breakfast, I said, hi, Steve, and they recognized I remembered their name and it made a difference. And then the following year when they came back again, if I could remember their name, that was a really big deal. And so, um, you know, I think that was a big part of it was, was introducing yourself to the people as, as an employee, as you know, in, in my younger years, I was just the guy who was carrying bags, um, and cleaning fish. But, but what I think, what I think really helped was to to quickly interact with people and and treat it as if you were showing them around your house, and that's really how it felt. It was, hey, welcome to my place. I want to I want to show you a good time the next few days. I, just building on that a little bit, you you've shared um, you know in in other interviews you've done a little bit about kind of that those formative early years for you, uh, you know, being working in these hospitality businesses, but also at home. Um, engaging with entertaining people, 
it sounds like you grew up in an environment with a lot of that. Were, were there any um, things that stood out to you from from those early years? It could be personally, you know, within your family or or professionally that have kind of shaped how you think about hospitality broadly. Yeah, I think a lot of it for me was was that um, the element of business and, and the focal point of business wasn't always just serious. It wasn't just numbers and terms and, and uh, you know, the deadline and, and objectives. That wasn't what was my perspective of hospitality and business in general when I was younger because where I got exposed to it, obviously I wasn't in the office every day and I wasn't working at those times, but but what I got exposed to was was the the holiday parties and the conventions and the the franchisee gatherings and things like that, whether it was a hunting trip or a fishing trip or an owner's meeting um, that some for some reason I, I was able to attend from a very young age and interact with a lot of people um, that typically I think a kid wouldn't be interacting with. And so for me, I, I saw that business was about was about how well you can talk to people or how well you can get people's attention. So for me, that I think that became my overall perspective of how you do business is you engage people and then, and then out of that comes a relationship that out of that comes an opportunity. And, and that, if I, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it that way when I was younger, but looking back on it, that's what makes sense to me. I love it. And you've also said that some of your key early role models were entertainers. Do you mean that in the sense of entertaining at home or more like public figure entertainers? No, I, I mean, in a, in a sense of, of entertaining uh, in a group of people, not necessarily at home, but in those same settings and those same opportunities, conferences, conventions, gatherings, trips, things like that. Um, you know, I just remember there's a lot of people who really intrigued me, whether it was my grandfather and the way that he would carry a room and, and tell stories. But I think the most, the, the entertainers that I could reference the most as I look at uh, my memories of, of younger days and earlier parts of the career, and even today for that matter, there's some people that I really gravitate towards. They're great storytellers. And out of that comes the entertainment. But but you also find connection through storytelling and and I think that's a really big advantage for people who are capable of, of just sitting down and telling a story. You, you can, you can weed through the, the introductory phase and get into the, how do we do things together phase pretty quickly. I love it. And your grandfather, of course, was the founder of super eight, you know, the, the um, in incredible hotel brand. You mentioned his ability to carry a room. You talked about storytelling being important to that. Were there any other attributes that, just spending time with him, you noticed that helped him in that ability to carry the room and, and provide that environment for people? Yeah, certainly being passionate about what you do. I mean, when you, when you live the business that you're in um, and, and the profession that you're, that you're, uh, you know, working to be, to be great at, it's really easy to talk about. And so in that, it's not too difficult to captivate people. I think he would he would say if you asked him, he would say he never enjoyed public speaking and he wasn't ever any good at it. And I, I don't know that, you know, public speaking is all that much fun for me. But in a group of uh, eight or 10 people telling a story and, and you know, enjoying learning about them, um, I'm very comfortable. And I saw that, you know, he always was, too. And a lot of those storytellers, that was the biggest that was the biggest attribute that attracted you to them is they were just really comfortable in, in conversation. I love that. And it's always fascinating to watch how different threads connect through our lives, right? And so those early experiences, things that you saw there, um, and people who are listening to the audio won't be able to see this, but you know, we're looking at, at just gorgeous trees. We were talking about before we hit recording, uh, before we hit, started recording, the um, you know, kind of the entertainment uh, uh, part of, of your, your facility. Tell us a little bit more about that and kind of why did you prioritize that as you thought about your corporate uh, campus? Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's always been part of the culture since I was younger, as I said, I mean, it, it, bringing people into town, we live in Aberdeen, South Dakota. There's a lot of people in the world who have never seen or know, or, and don't know anything about Aberdeen. You say something about Kansas city or, or Omaha or, you know, other places in the Midwest and they have some frame of reference, but you get more rural like we are. And, uh, you know, it, it's always surprising. We had a group of people here last week that are from 
uh, Maryland, uh, Virginia, uh, part of the country, and and they'd never been out here before. And so you get those people in here, actually in another group that was from uh, Phoenix. But so both sides of the country converging on the middle of the upper Midwest and I get here and go, wow, I, I thought it was cold here. And it was 95 degrees outside. Um, we have a ton of green trees. We have really beautiful landscapes out here in spite of the fact that it's pretty flat. Um, the fact that it's flat and the fact that, you know, we're in the upper Midwest, you, if you go about a hundred yards that way, um, you can see for probably five miles because there's hardly any trees either. So it's just a totally different perspective than you get in a lot of areas of the country. And, and so when we bring people here, it's, it's more than just a meeting. It's, it's an experience. It's an exposure to um, a, a culture and a demographic of people that often are very easily perceived to be different than what you find as you head east and west uh, from here. And so um, in our facilities here, we really enjoy bringing, bringing people in and, and having, uh, I'll say, not necessarily a meeting, but uh, an opportunity to share meals and and tell stories for a couple of days. And that's really the, the basis for it. So the venue we've got here is a really great spot to do that, both indoors and outdoors, We're mostly indoors in the wintertime because it does get cold. But outdoors in the summer is great here. Uh, it's a beautiful place. I love it. One other element of uh, your career journey I, I want to touch on, you mentioned getting into construction and development. How did that come to be? Were you curious about this or was it an opportunity that presented itself? Um, a little bit of both, actually. I, I'd say, you know, naturally, I've been a, I've been a builder all my life. So going back to Legos when I was a kid, all the way through uh, to, uh, you know, as a teenager, building things around the house or, or solving problems through, through figuring out how something works and then replicating it has always been a big interest of mine. And I think some of that is instilled early on from, from seeing such a big element of the business that happened around here and a focal point of the conversations being hotel development and, you know, this project being built here and, and, uh, and how it went together and how the construction company was doing we were always big parts of it. And I'd say, you know, all of those things collected together to, to represent an interest for me. And then the opportunity came along um, in the form of, as I exited college and started into the business, uh, I was, my mentor, my grandfather pointed me in the direction of, you need to start in construction. That's where, that's where the, that's where a hotel starts. You make your money when you build something, you, you build it well, you know how to put it together, then you know how to maintain it. You know how to, how, how, it, what it's going to cost and, and what to expect and what you need to do to make it successful in terms of operations. And so, that's uh, that's where I got directed to, and that transitioned into development pretty quickly. Um, and then development and construction go hand in hand. And uh, uh, after doing that for several years, then you know, kind of all the other aspects of the business came into my purview as well. But the entry point, and probably the the place that I love to be the most uh, in terms of day to day work, is on the construction side. I love it. And for people who have no context, don't understand this world, how would you describe the difference between development and construction? Uh, so development, you're, you're really working with the concept of, I want to, I want to end up with a hotel operation that services guests with hotel rooms and great service. In order to do that, I've got to find the location. I've got to assess the real estate. I've got to go through the processes of evaluating a market from here's what it's going to cost to, to here's what it's going to take to support those costs and create uh, a, a viable investment. So the development aspects are really on, on the very front end and require a lot of, um, they require a lot of, uh, a lot of research and development of, of an idea and, and taking the risk to uh, put that into play. Whereas construction is really the nuts and bolts and mechanics of, of uh, the design and concept uh, and bringing it to fruition. So I think our hotel business and, and, and business that deals with tangible assets in general is really unique that way. And then you have those three completely separate components of the theory and concept that leads to the, the compilation of materials and labor to create the physical product. And then finally, the, the service aspect of it is how do, we, how do I make that tangible asset that I created actually function and, and uh, create and, and build value. So 
I love it. Um, let's talk a little bit about My Place Hotels. What, what was the opportunity that you saw that led you to found the company? Um, so prior to starting My Place, again, working in construction and development primarily, we were building, um, developing, building, and operating hotels of all major brands during uh, the period between Super 8 and My Place. And so got a lot of exposure to what's popular in the industry today. Of course, we were going along with the industry trends in terms of, you know, the size and scale and, and brands and, and objectives of, uh, of hotels of, of that day and today as well. Um, and so I think what we found is some of the fundamentals that we could reference back to in Super 8 had, had really become overtaken by, by marketing propaganda, you know, amenities and things that just didn't seem to be productive in terms of being a hotel operator. Uh, and so as we looked at that and we looked at the inconsistencies in terms of, in terms of budget expectations going into a development project, the inconsistencies in terms of, of support and focus and operations in working with other brands who said, you know, hey, we're not, we're not doing bad here. It's been a productive business. We've been successful in the investments that we've made, but I think we could do it better. And, and how do we do it better was the question. Um, and so I think that's really the, the genesis of it. And then, and then, you know, Ron saying, Hey, I, I've, I've always wanted to get back into franchising since super eight. So why don't we give it a try and see, see what comes out of it. And that was, that was really, it was relatively simple. It's, it's, I, I, I love being a hotelier and we have the ability and the infrastructure to do it. Um, how do we make what we're doing a little bit better and, and fit more for us? And how do we fill a space that we believe and perceive to be sort of empty in, in a growing way in our hotel industry? So that's where my place came up. Can you tell me a little bit more around some of the things that you heard from others that were not working with the models from some of the larger brands? You, you talked a little bit about this of inconsistency of the budgeting development process, the operational support, you know, mm -hmm. is there any other things that you were hearing that the model out there just was, was, not, was a little broken? Yeah, I think, I think there becomes, um, a lot of focus and, and emphasis gets put onto onto lesser elements of the business when when the guidance is being handed down from people who don't engage in the the three primary uh, elements of the business. So, you know, developers are going to have a certain input, contractors are going to have a certain input and priority, and operators are going to have a certain input and priority. And so. Um, you hear a lot of things from operators about how inefficient certain processes or certain amenities or certain programs are and how they could do it a lot better if they weren't bound to participate in those things or go about it that way. They loved other elements of it, but they didn't like these two or three things. And so if you, you know, for us and, and the, the organization that we have here surrounding my place and has been in existence since the very beginning is very vertically integrated. We do everything in house. Um, and so if I'm focusing on a, a, an element of construction for one of our hotels, I have to also consider management and development because those are, those are elements of my overall business and my day to day also. Uh, so you get some imbalances that happen. And I think that's where we found them from from, hey, there are too many rooms. We don't need to build 80 to 120 room hotels just to justify land cost. You have to look at the other side of it and say, well, sure, 80 or 120 rooms is great if I can fill 70 plus percent of them on an average night. But if I'm not gonna be able to do that, I'd much rather have a lower room count going in and be able to uh, be more efficient with a smaller inventory. That's a that's a big one that, that came out of it. Uh, getting rid of some of the, the ineffective amenities that have become standards of marketing and hospitality, pool, breakfast, those sorts of things, which many of them, coincidentally, we saw almost disappear during the last few years. And it didn't seem to impact the guest experience all that much. Um, and and as, an, as a hotel operator, you, if you're paying attention, you recognize the utilization on those things. And, and you say, geez, you know, with the 
five or 10 or 20 or 50, whatever the number is, dollars I'm spending per room I rent to provide those things and the few people that are using them, is it really going to impact their state? There's so many opportunities in the, in the world today for quick service food, for example. Is the food and beverage offering in typical select service hotels really as important as it used to be? And um, so some of, those, some of those questions that we asked ourselves and decided to take the risk in trying out um, have really panned out pretty well. And you hear a lot of, if you gather a group of people around a table and, and ask them those questions, you'll hear a lot of input on those things. And there's, a, there's pages and pages of them, but uh, those are a few. Vertical integrations, something that seems very efficient, right? And I'm hearing this from different people I respect a lot, and it seems very attractive to just own that stack of these different uh, parties that could be different companies and you just get everyone on the same page. I'm curious what's difficult about operating in this way. You know, what, what challenges have you found about vertical integration and operating in a vertically integrated way that, that you had to overcome? Uh, there are quite a few challenges and I'd say more so than efficiency, uh, vertical integration creates value and it creates balance. So you get, you get diversification of your daily activities inside of your primary objective and so if it's a slow period for hotel operations maybe construction has quite a few projects in the pipeline and is doing better so you just get through that you, you get a lot of diversification another benefit to it is control you you maintain a broader spectrum of control in the investments that you make if you cover more of the bases uh, if you become the expert in more of the areas that uh, that your investment entails. Um, the drawbacks to it though are, are not insignificant either. I mean, it, it takes a lot of infrastructure and it takes a lot of fundamental capital and support in order to be able to maintain it. Um, and you have to be able to attract good people. You have to find experts in every aspect of your business. So while that's a great thing to have them, it's not always easy to find them. Um, and as a, as a leader in an organization like that, you, you're, definitely challenged to become as knowledgeable and as proficient at every one of those areas as you can, um, which, which is uh, not outside of the realm of stressful in a lot of days, um, requires a lot of ability to take risk. And uh, I think there's, there's a pretty significant element of risk involved in a vertically integrated organization because you don't, you don't shift the responsibility outside at, really any point, I mean, or there are very few, but, but uh, it, it's very rewarding though. I, I wouldn't have it any other way. It's what I was, it's what I was exposed to from the very beginning. And I really can't say that I know anything else, um, but I can definitely see from the inside out that there are other ways of going about it that people are very successful at. This is just the right one for us. I love it. And I imagine there's a certain sense of knowing yourself, knowing your, what you're good at, you know, the people around you are good at, and that takes good judgment, right? As to yeah. operate out of that. But I, I also appreciate you breaking that down. I, I want to stay on this theme of what you've learned, because for me, my place hotels is a really interesting story because it's newer than some of the other larger companies out there, but it's not new, new, you know, it, you've been going good, you know, 10 or so years, you have critical mass hotels across the country, I imagine a lot of learnings from, you know, operating over the past decade. Is there anything else that, um, I guess, kind of themes or, or broad learnings that have stood out to you as you reflect back on the, the past 10 years in terms of how you've seen your model play out? Yeah, I think um, one, of the, one of the most rewarding attributes to my place at this point is that we have really had to change very little about the design or the concept or the operating model over that initial period of time. Um, I think the, the thoughtfulness and the knowledge that was input into the concept at the very beginning um, has really proven out to be sustainable and, and that's, that's been extremely rewarding. We've obviously changed little things and you're constantly tweaking and constantly growing in your understanding of the product and, and uh, finding better ways to do things, but it's been really rewarding not to have to change a lot of things. We've learned that that consistency is something that, you know, you can, you can have it, but it's very difficult to, to talk about. I can say, 
hey, let me, let me tell you how consistent these operations are. Let me tell you what you should be able to rely on in terms of a, a capital budget or an operating budget in these hotels. And, um, and people say, oh, yeah, that, uh, that's great, you know, but until they really experience it, then, the, then they, they really don't understand until they do. And I've had, I've had franchisees come back after building and operating their first one and say, I see what you're talking about now. And, and uh, uh, it really is, it's that substantially different than what has been the focal point in, in hospitality franchising for so many years that uh, it really, it's a, it's a, it's an adjustment for sure. Um, I think, you know, finding out that we, that we hit on several things and, and the most fundamental things that were sustainable has been really great. We've also learned that um, technology is exceptionally important and our ability to identify a need for expanding or modifying technology is, has been one of the biggest challenges that, that we've faced over the growth period or this initial growth period. Um, it's hard to understand how the simple act of, of renting a room can be so reliant on technology, whether it's from the, from the sales and marketing and reservations aspects of things to the, to the analysis um, of operations and, and the minutia of uh, efficiency management within operations that we're so reliant on technology for. So, um, you know, starting a, starting a hotel brand and, and building that uh, is not an easy thing to do. Um, but I think it's been, it's been relatively easy for us if, if that's uh, an appropriate way to characterize it, just because of the amount of forethought in it and the ability to be nimble as we've gone through the process. So, so learned a lot about technology and its impact on hotels over the, over this period, learned a lot about um, what consistency really means in, in operations and in, in uh, investment. Um, but really the, the guests, what they're looking for, uh, what, what makes them happy, keeps them coming back, what's attractive really hasn't changed much. I think that's fundamental. And, uh, and we, as people, what we're looking for in hotels, you know, maybe it's a little different from, you know, specific resort destination or, or, uh, or, or convention property to another. But when you look at the cross section of hotels that, that we find ourselves in, I think guest expectations and demands have maintained themselves pretty well for a lot longer than we've been in the business. Interesting. I want to go back to something you mentioned, an observation that you had in the years forming this brand where, you know, with, with, with other brands, operators said that there's a lot of inefficiencies that they saw and things that they could do better. Imagine this is a very challenging thing to balance of, of the consistency in building this brand model while still being attentive to what your teams on the ground are noticing and opportunities they see for change. As the leader of the company, how do you think about balancing those two things? They feel in tension or they, they feel like they're pulling in different directions. Definitely. Um, I, think, I think creating or finding that balance among, among a team and finding that balance with, uh, with the support systems and, and the people desiring to be supported uh, really comes most naturally by asking questions. Right. So uh, creating creating an idea or creating an objective and then going and, and pushing it out there for people to try doesn't necessarily work unless prior to doing those things, you've gone out and asked enough people, how is this working for you? What would this look like if you tried this differently? Have you have you tried this and this and that um, in order to see where it works? And people are creatures of habit, right? So in, unless you challenge them to change something that they're doing, they don't necessarily change it. And, and so asking those questions really expands the, the, the purview um, of, of people on both sides. And, and as you kind of, it, it doesn't always happen, but, but when you find people on both sides of that equation that are willing to expand their, their purview and say, oh yeah, I'd be, maybe I could try that. You find them coming a lot closer together. Um, if, if I have, if I have somebody on the support side that says, here's how we need to do it. 
and I'm telling all these people that they need to do it this way and they're not, what's happening? I say, well, have you engaged them by asking them what they think about what you're saying? Um, and, and so the conflict is really when it's, when it's binary, uh, when that relationship is binary, it just, it, it doesn't work. It, it breeds that conflict. So you really have to have to create, you know, a multidimensional uh, arrangement or, or engagement in order to try new things and see what works and quickly move out of them when they don't. I think that's a really key element of it is not staying in it too long when it's not working. I love it. Um, zooming out for a moment, you know, if you look at a map of your hotels, it's beautiful communities across America, right? But but a very um, very very diverse communities, right? Just all all different different parts of our country. Um, I'm curious what you've seen on the opportunity for your hotels to create economic activities in, in or activity in the communities that they operate within. How are they part of that larger? Um, story of these communities growing and, and expanding and, and, and doing well? Yeah, I, it's really difficult to, to identify broad and general ways because um, a hotel is really designed as a support. It's not necessarily the front runner in economic development in a hotel. It supports economic development, right? And in a lot of the smaller communities we've gone into, we found that our, our, hotel going in was the first extended stay built in the town. And what that precipitated was the road construction crews or the plant manufacturing crews um, or the survey crew that came through for a you know municipal project. Now we're willing to stay there because they had a better option that allowed them to stay for an extended period of time, as opposed to staying 20, 30, 40, 50 miles away in the next bigger community that had something for them. So some of those, some of those aspects of, of us going into a community have been really rewarding to see. Um, oftentimes it's about the people that are in the community and finding opportunities for them. A, a, a person who's been a assistant manager in a, in a fast food restaurant for the last five years, but hasn't had the ability to move up within that and there really isn't a good landscape of finding that next step, you know, that may be a good opportunity to come in and become a manager at my place hotel, move on beyond that to a, a regional director of operations or director of marketing and sales, whatever they're inclined to, um, and, and really pull people up from, from where they come from by just becoming part of the community and creating those opportunities for individuals. That's an exciting, um, thing to think about. And, um, you know, sort of related to that, but a, a little different way to to think about that. When you're when you're building a hotel, you're essentially making a bet on that community and, and its growth right. prospects. And I'm curious how you, your teams, you know, your partners, people you work with, um, uh, should be thinking about that. You know, kind of what are some of the factors that you think about that lead you to believe this will be this is a good opportunity for our next hotel? Yeah, I think a big question that's asked on the very front end of a development and should be asked by everybody regardless of what hotel brand it is um is what is this what is this street what is this neighborhood this community or city going to look like five years from now uh where's where's it really heading where's the overall plan what does it look like 10 years from now um and and that's a that's a big question we ask ourselves now now sometimes it's a lot easier to see than others um you have you have you know, heavy development happening in a lot of places around the country, um, economic improvement incentives that that have created strong development demand and, you know, or just growing populations in places like Phoenix or or Dallas or uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, for that matter, um, really make it easier to see where the community is heading, what what kind of prioritization is happening with respect to infrastructure, attracting business, attracting leisure, attracting entertainment. Um, some of the smaller communities, it's a lot more difficult to see. And what, what you really have to look for is, is where's the consistency? Have, how consistent have they been? Have they been a boom and bust community or have they really been uh, a pretty confident, you know, slow growth stability type of market? And, and both are very viable and both have proven to be very successful over the years. Um, but there's a different approach in each one of those too. And so the, the idea that you don't just go in and say, how well is the hotel 
you know, what does the star report look like in any given market? And uh, what are what are the competitors? What how do they look? And, you know, when is Amazon moving in or something like that? You can't just ask those kind of granular and, and very pinpointed questions. You have to ask the overall questions of of what overall does this community look like and how could I if I'm going to own this thing for the next 40 years, what should I expect and how should I program my investment that way? And I think some people leave that part of it out. They kind of focused on very narrow short term. And a lot of developments and a lot of investors that work with us and, and uh, in other places are focused on three to five years and they want to keep moving. Um, and But regardless of that, there's always a potential that you might have it for longer. So make sure that you're doing it the right way for the long haul is important. I love it. Um, as, as you think about um, moving the, the business forward, I'm curious where you look for inspiration. What inspires you and gives you kind of fresh ideas and, and uh, yeah, excitement on, on taking this business forward? Um, I, I think really the same thing that, that pushed in the beginning to, to try it is how do we continue to make this better? Um, we're constantly looking at how do we change the operating model? How do, how do we change the staffing model? How do we create, you know, better careers for the people in, in the hotels, which means that we get more consistency out of the service model and out of the care and maintenance of, of the properties. We're constantly looking at how do we reconfigure a hotel room or reconfigure a, a space inside of a hotel room um, in order to make it more functional or more attractive or more functional and attractive. And so those sorts of things are great opportunities and they're really the best element of, of stimulus for, for moving forward for us is, and we have franchisees come in and, you know, every new franchisee that comes in has got some idea about something um, that should be different. And it's funny because, you know, people buy on a, buy into a 20 year relationship and, and take the, take the, the reins on, on investing millions of dollars into this, into this relationship. Um, and they immediately want to find something that they can change about it. I've never quite understood that, but uh, I guess it is the way it is. It's, it'd be like taking a pair of, you know, Nikes for running and immediately going and filing down the sole because you wanted them to be a millimeter thinner or something. Come on, you know, uh, it's made for a specific purpose. Having said all that, there are a lot of people that come in some, with some really great ideas who have influenced the refinement and the, and the growth and the maturity of, of my place. And I think that's another element that really is, uh, is motivating and, driving factor for us is that maybe the next person that comes in has something that adds just this much to uh, a concept we've been working on for a while and we just hadn't gotten there, you know? So every new relationship we create, it turns into uh, some broadened perspective on the business that we're in and, and where we're headed in the future. 